Hi, everyone. Welcome back to another dialogue with Scott Killaby and hi, Aljou, in this series of uh, psychotherapy and non-duality. And uh, this is part two from uh, last time when we talked about uh, Scott's discovery of the the map of three dimensions of practice, and we are going to have this up soon. Um, where Scott, working with himself uh, and with thousands of people for a long time, discovered that three types of you know work are necessary, uh, and they all have different types of flavors of practices uh, necessary that might be very different from each other, almost seemingly contradictory, three types of work in order to uh, experience a true awakening with a true embodied freedom, not just a disembodied, avoidant of life, avoidant of feeling awakening, which I don't think it's a real awakening. So we were talking last time. And uh, yeah, if you just come to this video, it's not going to make a lot of sense. So please watch the previous video um part one and also all of these are in a playlist available on scott's site and my youtube channel uh we have i think this is uh, episode 25 where we go in depth about um awakening and processing trauma and focusing on the ki modality but not only so last time so welcome, Scott. Thanks for coming here and sharing this with the world. Thank you for having me and for sharing it. Yeah, big made a big uh, difference in my life. Although I've done a lot of work before I met you. And it makes a big difference in people that I work with. Yeah. Good. Makes me cry. Hmm. Me too yeah. sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So last time we just went thorough last episode into the first dimension of practice and into a second dimension of practice and the, the benefits and the shortcomings of each of them. We are not going to go into that. And we just arrived at the third dimension of practice, where is the, the very depths, I get, it's where the very depths of the unconscious, if we use psychological terms or if we use Eckhart Tolle terms, that will be the, the where's the thickest, darkest, most painful pain body. Um, or if we use other non-dual terms, where's the most separate sense of separation? <laughs> yeah. So, um, and this, this episode, it will be dedicated on on this exploring the third dimension and we are aware this is theoretical now we are speaking theoretically we are this video will go to many people that are already doing the work uh working with scott or people that uh scott is training or the in the uh, uh, ki members area that i i encourage people to check it out where this work is done experientially and there are people doing it and sharing with each other you know this can be done on youtube uh yeah so can you share scott from your own experience somehow because you were the uh like icebreaker this ship going in uncharted territory i feel and uh share a little bit of like you're you're discovering the the need of the third dimension practices and how you stumbled on it as well as maybe start with like what's in there you know now we got to the depth of the ocean <laughs> underneath thoughts and feelings and current triggers and underneath limiting beliefs and sense of deficiency identities and Underneath that, there is some other creatures that fuel the whole sense of me. So what is there? And how did you discover and stumble and perfect this? I stumbled upon it 
being in chronic pain and not getting any relief, not only from doctors and posture and all sorts of physical things that I was doing. I just got minimal relief. Uh, and then from all other forms of inquiry and spiritual practice. So I exhausted everything that I knew first. And I even went back and researched some of the traditions to see, if, is there something that I missed here? But I couldn't find it anywhere. And I found the answer, first answer in Dr. Sarno's book. I had to go outside of spirituality for me. I had to. And I understood that what he was saying is that that could be anger repression. But then I didn't have any, again, any skills to access that. So in first dimension and second dimension, I literally could not access it. That's why I always talk about the dimensions because I couldn't. So in other words, just real quick so I can show you how I discovered it. First dimension, not prompting anything up. It just appeared as pain, period. There was no mind, no sense of anger. So first dimension doesn't work for me. Second dimension didn't work because as I asked questions like, what does this pain have to say? <laughs> it would produce everything except the repression. So it produced what was safer. But with an open-ended question like that, it's like the intelligence of that system just stayed unconscious. So prompting up, second dimension mining, didn't mm -hmm. see it. And even the identity, we had the map up last time, it couldn't find it anywhere in there because it was a repression. <laughs> mm -hmm. So whatever identity or trigger was happening, if there were any, there weren't that many, there wouldn't be anger there. So everything was hiding it from me, every spiritual practice. And eventually what I did was I took our reverse inquiry and I just felt into the pain and said, I'm not angry. Hmm. Nothing came up in the mind but felt something in the body. And so I just started to really listen to it because it was obviously saying no, I heard that. Mm -hmm. But then as I, as I listened more, I understood it had an intelligence. I started to hear it. It's basically hold that back. <laughs> Once I heard it, <clears throat> then I started to learn how to develop the tools and eventually something close to rapid firing, which we'll get to later, but it was you a discovery that-, that You did, I'm not angry. There was nothing in the mind, but there was some there which you translated as no. And then yeah. later, I am angry. And yeah. then, but don't go there. Hold this back. Right. It will be yeah. like later, we'll talk about this, the commands, like a nervous system repression commands, right? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But can I just fast forward real quick and come back? It's because now when I go into, there's no pain. So if I go into there and I say, I'm not angry. It, there's nothing there. The reason that I say that is because at first I didn't understand what the body was saying mm -hmm. until I could just tell it, tell all of you now, though, if the body's responding to something, that means there's something there. And yeah. so if you don't get a response. That's not there. And so any response indicates some hidden something. Is what I yeah. Say. Yeah. And then your other question, Mihai, was what did I find there or yeah what do you find did you find there in your own experience but also you you have so much it's opposed to many teachers that just do big groups I mean some are doing small groups on one-on-one -on -one, but you've done so much one-on-one -on -one with people yeah what do you notice that you they have there at the deepest level the basement you know like an in inception the movie <laughs> right. it's, it's like a go to elevator where it's locked yeah <laughs> yeah yeah well I, i'll try to understand your question first like because i want to make sure i answer it correctly what do you just kind of narrow it for me a little bit more what's there well i guess there's what's what's there i mean i guess it's i know that there is some kind of primal core emotions and core wounded energies mm -hmm. and also some sense that don't don't go there also yeah. Uh, yeah so and trauma and so that's what what's the content that as we use third dimension practices what type of content arises now okay so in the process here i want to say it this way what i discovered is that i'm angry that i was angry my whole life that's the first that's what i want to say to people who hear this you have to see that when there's a repression, you're already sad, you're already angry. The KI can't produce something that isn't already yeah. there. Um, 
that's important <laughs> because you can start to see that it's actually an identification. It's an identification that's buried. And so, so I found the identification, eventually I found I'm angry. Like I found the authentic there. But before that I found is no, you can't hold that back. It's not safe. They're going to kill you, or at least you're going to lose them all. And all these really scary stories in terms of content mm -hmm. was really the most powerful thing at first, the shutdown on that. No, mm -hmm. no. And then eventually, as I worked with that, that conditioning weakened over time. And I just stopped getting a, I can't, or it got much weaker. And then I discovered I'm angry. <laughs> like once you peel off the repression, then you have to deal with what's really an identification. I'm angry. And then same sort of stuff. I just processed that because I didn't realize I was angry. So as you are working with these uh, tools on your own, mm. you started to feel anger, right? You started to feel anger. It will. So this, this tools, um, it will, it thawed out the, the frozen anger the one that you were angry, but you didn't know you were angry. Mm -hmm. Yeah. In, in, into actual like anger and like, yeah, it was on top. Yeah. Not at first. Mm -hmm. So that's why I've been telling people, like, I think one of the reasons that the repression remains unconscious for us is that by the time it's repression, it doesn't feel like anger. So that's the other thing. It felt like pain, but yeah. for other people, it might just feel like your inner body, even a contraction, just your inner body. So at first I didn't get anger. At first I was bamboozled into not even thinking it was anger because it felt like pain. So there's one layer of the yeah. self-deception there. And then I discovered that, oh, let me see if I want to say that, how I want to say this. If the anger eventually came, but not at first, what would happen would be like, I'm not angry. And just the pain would say, or I can get angry. The pain would say no to that, but there wasn't really any anger produced mm, until yeah. that lightened up and the conditioning that said no to that got weaker. Mm -hmm. And then I started to notice it started to come out in my daily life actually first, mm -hmm. not really in session. It would just come out mm. for the first time. It was really coming forward in my relationships, not really sometimes an inquiry. But this was several weeks into it before it really started to be anger. So you loosen up the, the cap on the uh, anger like oh don't show it you can't do it it's not okay various reasons why so that will be what we call the repression barrier and all its reasons and as that was loosened up then you yeah i get it you start to you feel the actual thing relationally and yeah and i guess you noticed i know from your story you noticed that as this was happening which from one angle you know like conscious awakened teacher that will be like hey what's going on here but at the same time it lessened your seeming physical pain it lessened it so it was like a correlation right between the more feeling of the emotion a diminishment of the physical pain 100 percent. that's why you can trust it because as you start to feel more of the repressed emotion you should, should start to feel the discomfort and the pain and the contraction decreasing yeah. And that's that's how I was able to trust the process. Because otherwise, if you're just getting angry and you don't understand that you're in a healing process and you repress anger, you might try to stuff it back down. But yeah. once I understood it was healing me, I just welcomed it and continued welcoming, continued just moving it through. Yeah, and then it just healed the pain. The mm -hmm. pain went away. Mm -hmm. that's the point. Not only did the pain go away, that's almost like downplaying it. There was a structure in my spine, a form mm -hmm. that was very painful and big. And it went up into my breathing area. So it just dissolved. It's not just the pain. It's the structure dissolved into just a little pinch on my spine after the anger repression, which is actually the pinch on the spine is what you see on an MRI. The actual structural mm -hmm. thing is what's left. Whatever inflammation or tension was around that, the pain is gone because of the mm -hmm. anger. Yeah. And, and this was happening as you were you were developing or you have developed already the second dimension KI and you were working with people to deconstruct deficiency stories and to witness one at a time and to uh, 
all of this utility inquiry and uh, reverse inquiry. And so you were going deeper with people and developing the method. And by yourself, you were on your own spare time out of necessity, you'll go even further, right? Yeah, exactly. The stuff that I saw through the years is the map with people. I also obviously saw it in myself. So the map comes from my experience and then watching others. Um, but for example, when I was guiding people, Mihai, for all those years, I didn't have any awareness of third dimension, see? So <laughs> there's not much I could actually help them with in a way on some of these issues. You could kind of point back to awareness and do some inquiry around what is showing up. But mm -hmm. you know, the question is what's not showing up, as you know. So through the years, I just found that's why there was so much stuff there that we couldn't get to mm -hmm. that <laughs> right there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So just mentioning in terms of helping people, that's how that came about. This it really isn't theory in a way. It's a map that explains everything I've been seeing and trying to guide people back to experience. Yeah. More than just being a theory. Yeah. I mean, a true map. I mean, even this GPS, all of these true maps are, helping to get to the territory so that's that's a true map it's not like a, yeah all right so I, I and so here then you became very uh, enthusiastic and saw this somehow as a way to apply what dr sarno uh, discovered um theoretically and i guess he had his own maybe methods of unclear methods how to make that happen so you you discover how to undo this repression on yourself and you started to work with others and you could see that by making conscious the repressed emotion and by diminishing the resistance towards them the emotional flow and we are not talking here about cathartic experiences like i'm like yeah just one time because I went through all of this uh, one time, second time, special workshop, cathartic, I broke, I killed, you know, in a special psychodrama thing. But it's like the, you, 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 you identify the mechanism of repression uh, and you loosen that up so that now the emotion can be allowed and you stay thorough with it, methodical, and you so that with you and many people who you notice that there are other people who they, they come with just like diagnosis or or chronic pain and all of that and you discover that basically to throw out the chronic pain and the, the chronic pain would change dissolve loosen up so you have quite a bit of experience with that can you share a little bit about this also other people because this is like, uh, I mean, I know Gabor Marte talks about it. And also cancer being, cancer being like, of course, there are many environmental factors and all kinds of factors for cancer. Our world is full of toxins and the food we eat is really toxic and all that. But there's this, you know, correlation of um, I am bad, I'm guilty or also not allowing uh, anger, not allowing anger, not putting boundaries somehow. There's many people, they discovered that it's correlated with cancer. I have some people who have advanced cancer and they come to me for psychotherapy. And as I probe into their, I see what's their psychic structure. I can see all of them that this is true. They were like, good boy. Not, it was not safe to uh, to to share to put boundaries so they all became internalized and so yeah what what did you discover with other people and it makes a lot of sense to me why they say this turns into cancer or chronic pain because we're angry <laughs> you know it's like just because you're repressing it doesn't mean that you're not angry and you're holding on to an emotion over a lifetime you've got programming that's continuously holding on to it continuously so like that's different than just anger mm -hmm. so if you get angry in a moment it's like i'm angry and then it's over if you're clear but with repressors we're anger our whole life mm -hmm. but we're repressing it that can't be good for the system 
Like it just can't be. I don't understand all the science, but it can't be healthy for us to be angry over a lifetime and then to deny it. Mm -hmm. So what Gabor is saying, he's saying authenticity heals disease. I mean, I'm not going to come out and say that because I'm not a doctor, but I'm going to point to him because yeah. he's right. like, literally, you're angry. <laughs> That's what it is. You're angry. That's why you're having cancer, because you can't feel and express that. You have to first acknowledge that you are angry because repressors won't even acknowledge it. And then when you you have to make it conscious, then that's what being authentic means is you really do have to make that conscious. Um, yeah. So there's a lot to say about the science and all that, but I'll leave that to the doctors. They're out there saying it. The scientists mm -hmm. are saying it. Thank God people are saying it. Mm -hmm. But what I want to help people with is the mechanism. Mm -hmm. What's actually going on mm -hmm. in the interior awareness, you know? Because I, you can say all day that authenticity <laughs> cures disease. It's not that easy. Yeah, not that easy. We need mechanic. We need we need skillful means with this. No, can I say something here? Because I mean, we don't know how it works, but it's there's that. It's not. It's not just that the anger, ongoing anger that I don't know I have, or hatred which i don't know i have creates cancer but that you know anger it's a god-given emotion actually gabor mate had this uh he was giving this illustration like he was at the stage and uh, there was a lady in the front row and he went a little closer to her and she was like how how is it now she was like it's good and then she went even closer to her how is it now she was like, mm, it's okay. Then really went into her space. And how is it now? And she was like, uh, it's a little. So so anger, it, we need to have as mammals like, hey, hey, back off. Back off, man, you are in my space. Hey, stop that. So healthy anger, God-given anger, is that to, 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 to be in touch with my signals and to, if... If I have a no, I don't want to do this, to say, I don't want to do this. Or if it's something hard to say it. So somehow the anger repression prevents us from being authentic. So okay. then I'm compromising my boundaries. I don't say what bothers me. I don't say no. I'm a, a pleaser. I'm a good boy. So this is kind of going against my own life force. And mm -hmm. I can see how even philosophically, if I am going against my life force and my truest signal, then that's what cancer does. From mm -hmm. when it manifests in the cell, the DNA changes, and now it's I'm I'm killing myself. You know, it just makes a lot of sense. It does. And the other thing is, is what I keep saying on YouTube is how that gets enmeshed, where anger repression can get enmeshed with some of the Eastern practices. I have to say it again. Is because if I'm already repressing anger and I can't say no, I can't set a boundary, then I might listen to the teachings which say, allow everything and it just gets enmeshed in there. And then people are getting sick from that. I'm an example of it. So you just have to be careful. I always say it. you have to be careful with the non-dual teachings because the anger repressor just gets enmeshed right in there and takes shelter in it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Go. Cool. Well, it, it, how that actually works would be, remember, we're already repressing anger. So if somebody points to that, uh, how do I say this? There's a step that has to happen for us first to repress anger. We have to acknowledge it <laughs> and feel it before we can just be pointed to the fact that it's ego is what I'm saying. And we've said this before on here, but it's always worth repeating again because there are people there Think about this. When I heard a teacher say, is that so? Or allow everything to happen. My system heard, don't get angry. <laughs> it, unconsciously, it heard that. And it just it meshed right in with the conditioning, even though that's not what the teacher meant. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, because if we say, you know, there's this tool in non-duality that you are not that. See that you are not that. Neti, neti. Which is is true because I'm there's there's the witnessing of that there is the perceiver of 
of the feeling or of the thought of the belief and that goes and i am the perceiver and this is true but it's not honest to say i'm not that which i don't even know is there so first you're saying first realize that there is that make it conscious uh yeah yeah so you worked with people who had similar things like yourself right i just want to 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 uh, drive this nail deep into the coffin <laughs> so to say like that had in like contractions and chronic pains and all kind of weird things they went to the doctor and 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 uh, you by doing this third dimension work their symptoms alleviated and yeah can you speak a little bit about this the experientially yeah well i saw it through the years not just in people that i was working with but in my friends and family uh, basically well in the spiritual community i would just sit there over and over with people and they would experience shadows triggers addictions mental health issues chronic pain and i just sat there year after year and recognizing that so many of them had those issues remaining they would get clearer over time but certain things would just remain and that became peculiar to me that I would be working with someone like who'd been in this kind of work for five or 10 years, who was just really getting stuck on something. And I didn't know how to go. All, all I could do was just point back to the awareness and just, just let that be, <laughs> you know, or start to do some inquiry, but not deep enough. So yeah, over time, this starts looking like a major systematic systemic bypass. Actually, mm -hmm. when you start looking cult cross culturally, how it's happening, mm -hmm. it's just the nervous system. It's not even cultural. It's the nervous system universally mm. protecting us. So since it's universal, we can put it into a map. It's not cultural. It's like, yeah, we might have more repression in Russia than we have somewhere else, but mm -hmm. still it's the nervous system seeking safety. So yeah. that's what I learned is just that how universal it is. The bypassing and the ego stuff is just universal. Mm. It allowed me to trust that. But I kept seeing those things. And it's only now, frankly, Mihai, in this stage of the, teaching where i'm seeing people actually healing stuff more mm. and that just shows me that that tells me everything about it it tells me that i didn't have the skill before mm -hmm. to help these people and neither did they mm -hmm. is the way i see it yeah it's interesting like if jung were to live now because he discovered this that there's the a collective unconscious and archetypal energies and archetypal symbols and so this is what you're calling a universal not cultural it's the repression is uh, some archetypal thing uh yeah yeah something about survival makes it universal yeah. we're surviving around really scary emotions and that's just a universal thing it seems and i want to bring here um that you know in in the uh, Scott's personal co configuration, there was this anger. Everything was uh, allowed, fears, sadness, hurt in his uh, path. But the anger was not allowed uh, an aggression. And, and he didn't even know he had this. And Scott talks a lot about this anger repression and you know, it's not all of us have this. It's not that the only repression is anger. We discovered is that uh, through the trauma and the adaptation to a unconscious uh, parental environment and unconscious culture, as Gabor Mate would be like in a toxic culture, would be raised in a toxic culture. <laughs> so we need to adapt to that. Um, some of us have like sadness uh, repression somehow we learned it was so overwhelming the sadness and the loss that we learned to push it down we don't even know we push it down and maybe our father was pushing it down in order to keep going to work and all that or fear repression or so it can be any other of the any other of the emotions can be as a primary repression uh, and the same tools, the same understanding applies to that. And also, if one is from our discoveries, if one feeling is the primary repression, 
it's very likely that the other ones are also. <laughs> so uh, I, I noticed like, at least for myself and other people, I need to go through phases where to focus on first the anger and, and rescuing the anger. And then as this started to flow more, then realizing, oh, there is actually shame or there's fear that I learned to push down and to come back to the, me, I did a lot of awareness practices and I'll just come back to the present and push all the creatures down. And I got very good at it. And so it keeps changing. They say in the path of undoing repression, it's a repression of authenticity of a feeling body. And two or three years ago, I was with anger. Then it went to this. Then I can see that the core one for me was sadness, sadness, grief. Anyway, so I just want to put this out there. Yeah. So thank you for bringing up the sadness repression. So an apology to everybody out there. If I talk about anger repression a lot, it's because it was my primary. And yeah. I can just speak from it very directly. And so, but I, was, I want to speak to sadness, for example, repression, because I have known people like that. And so let me address those folks. You may see some of the same stuff. You're probably going to see shadows. For example, people who are very emotional or vulnerable may or may not trigger you because you can't do that. See? So just look for that. Triggers are going to be like everyone else. You're going to be triggered into like a deficiency story that where you can't access the sadness. So again, just like everybody else, even though it's sadness repression, you're going to have that identity, that false self that comes up. And then in that, you're probably going to find some safer emotions like anger. And you might even be fooled into processing a lot of anger mm -hmm. as a way to stay away from the sadness. So it's the same profile. It's just different content. We're kind of all dealing with the same structure, you could say, but the, the actual repression is different for each of us. But we're because yours is different than mine. Like, even though there was some sadness repression, it wasn't really repressed in me. Mm -hmm. I could just go there, mm -hmm. couldn't with anger. But I totally get how there's that connection between those two. Yeah, for me, I could see that uh, I there were like uh, early uh, losses, losses, uh, multiple losses, as, even as a baby some kind of separation from the mother and later a six-year-old separation from another mother figure and and completely no memory actually although the memory is uh actually a feeling and a state that didn't come at all for many many years and so then i will have relationship after relationship where i would mysteriously from one day to the next something may turn off and i'll be like okay i'm done i'm done i'm uh I, I don't feel it so i will i will leave the relationship inexplicably and i i was confused well i mean so you see this pattern of let's say abandoning <laughs> uh i would just do this one after the other and i would also not feel much sadness at all and i will move on and uh, i could see later that this was like somehow my system was protecting itself from feeling loss mm -hmm. and the way to do that is they don't get too close don't get too close in an intimate relationship because then you may experience that so i will just bounce out they started to catch up with me in my 30s so and and I started to have this like as even if I will leave the relationship, I would leave it. I mean, from this pattern, then I would feel this deep sense of overwhelming, very young state of um, totally alone and and overwhelming, like like grief, sadness, longing, underneath fear. So I'll have these states that they will be so out of the blue and so overwhelming that I really didn't want them. So I could see that all my life in spiritual path, these were put down. And now I was 
in non-duality and I still they had no tools to do that so I would push them down now and yeah so and now looking back I could see that at the end of a relationship I would uh, not feel sad which is a legitimate sad loss uh, and even I remember some maybe five maybe seven years ago it was end of a relationship and I felt contraction in my chest like burning like needles in my chest and I was like huh and I was a therapist at that time man and I was like oh okay and uh, uh okay so just welcome it let it be as it is I am I'm that in which it arises the needles I'm I'm the way I'm that in which the needles arise I was a therapist and a non-dualist and so now I know because I'm going through a loss and a separation now and I now sit <laughs> I, I want to meditate I sit and I feel contraction in my chest and needles but now I have these tools and I just, I'm not just, I'm I'm not even going into, hey, I'm not that because I, I know that that is a bypass. So I'm kind of going into them. And then even without doing anything, it starts to be like a tear. <laughs> and then I go into this, I'm, I'm not sad. And then that will say, no, I'm sad. I'm sad. So anyway, I noticed that these needles and this contraction actually was sadness, a lifetime of sadness, plus this current sadness. And also in the needles, there was the sadness and the don't feel this. The, I don't like this. Don't feel it. Be strong. Be strong. Don't go there. Uh, and so, yeah, so only now for maybe a year or so, I, I'm... I'm I'm doing that basically I'm and this now I'm basically it's interesting I I have to do this third dimension work to thaw out these needles and this contraction to actually make the the sadness flow and and then to cry so for me that's a big achievement yeah. and then I can still sense the I hate this as a part of me is like <laughs> I don't like this, man. I don't like this. So there are other programs there that still they are like. And then I used to go, you know, well, my story is everybody's story. You may have other feelings, uh, but then I will go, okay, well, I need to smoke. I'm going to smoke something. I'm going to drink something. I'm going to go on a dating site. I'm going to do a, a non-dual guided meditation. Uh, so this not wanting to feel it's hard to do it <laughs> so i need to you need to use extra help with substances and so the this is the scott's discovery is that this urges uh, is just to a way to alleviate this repression basically and to try to keep it down yeah Yeah, to be fair, I didn't discover that. That's science, you know, but that science says that the trauma and repression is behind that. But we've discovered it in direct experience with KI. Mm -hmm. Can I can I take you through a profile of a, just a random person that I've seen with sadness repression? Just for the people, because we spend so much time in angry repression. Let me say yeah. a couple of things. Yeah. People might not even recognize how the sadness repression is running everything on the path. But like, I've already said a little bit of it. But for example... Let me just say, there's a person, Joe. Joe has addictions, okay? Mm -hmm. Joe's primary uh, repression is sadness. Let's say Joe doesn't know that. So he comes into the awareness teachings. What he notices is an addiction that won't go away. That's all he notices. And he notices depression, a mental health issue. Okay, so he starts becoming interested in mindfulness. A little bit of peace from that, but not getting to the core sadness. So you can't really have a real deep there without going there. But he stays in the practice. He goes into second dimension. Here, 
he notices again the deficiency story. The deficiency story comes up whenever he gets too close to that sadness and it just feels very scary and he starts to become aware of it, let's say. But even as we come, so let's say that Joe becomes trauma informed somewhere in first and second dimension. That does not mean that Joe is ready to go to third dimension. Mm -hmm. It's not what that means. What it means is that Joe is aware of the issue. But even if you become aware of the issue, you could literally almost choose not to do it. You can even be aware of it and still not want to go there. So then it becomes even more painful for Joe because mm -hmm. now he knows the source of the problem. So every time he goes for, so he tries medication which might help, but he also knows that when he tries medication, he's covering up the repression. So he knows it now, it's not a solution. So it's like you, the bamboozling goggles are being taken off in every single way. And it's pointing him to the fact that he has to meet the sadness, but his entire life is devoted to making sure it doesn't happen. Mm -hmm. Going to meds, going to mindfulness and meditation, as long as that's safe and I don't have to feel sadness. <laughs> so his whole life is built around it. And then the addictions continue, stomach issues or some other issues because the repression is eating away, whatever. That's a that's a common profile actually for somebody in yeah. spirituality. Yeah, I feel like I'm Joe. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> With some variation. Right. Yeah. So Well, so the answer for Joe is when he's ready to begin third dimension practice. <laughs> That's the point of it. But if he's not ready, if he's still looking for everything but that, there's no way that Joe would even be yeah. someone candidate for KI. So you have to be ready. In other words, you can't just know this stuff, be trauma informed and assume that you're yeah. ready for this. Yeah. And this readiness, I mean, is, you know, in non-dual circles and perhaps even you would say things like, hey, you're not ready. It's like you're not ready. Uh, so this readiness is actually, um, I guess, having a few years of gradually developing skills uh, that with those skills, you are uncovering some type of pain body and you verify that you survived and you, you felt some deep feelings, which was very hard, but it was okay. And then it increases the confidence in, in our own ability to witness and allow. And then also maybe have a few more failed relationships where the same shit happens over and over. That Joe realizes that, man, there's something here with me, man. <laughs> and then Joe goes to some more teachers and that doesn't work. And so... Yeah, a combination of developing skills, developing trust in the ability to to take the heat and uh, getting tired of the same shit happening over and over again. And so, and here is actually one concept you were talking some time ago, the safety versus freedom. Because now, you know, trauma is a, buzzword and it's in social media everywhere trauma this trauma that and trauma informed and uh, which is is wonderful you know because trauma is uh there's trauma collective trauma that creates this selfishness in the world and there's trauma underneath all these corporations and the government yeah the after the effects of this this selfishness and self-centeredness and sense of separation but so okay now we know about trauma, but there is this focusing on to be safe. Hey, just which makes a lot of sense. Like you can't process trauma if I'm I'm freaking out. I'm dysregulated. You can't do it. So it has right. to be processed within the window of tolerance. Otherwise, I'm spinning it. I'm 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 um, tortured for days. So yes, there is. So can you speak about this somehow? Yes, the need of safety and what does that mean? But but we can't stay at the safety level because then I'm just managing and soothing the trauma. Yeah. And yeah. Yeah. Okay. I have another way to answer it for some reason. It's coming up right now, which is that in first and second dimension practice, you're not aware of the mind-body connection that's shutting you down, first of all. So what how what would you do with that if you don't see that? You have to manage it. 
you have to manage the effects of that unconsciousness there. So whether you go to meditation, breathing, some sort of nervous system resilience thing, you go there because you have to, because you don't, you can't see yet the conditioning that's shutting you down. So it's almost like you're forced into either getting like really dysregulated, as you say, or learning to somehow just manage that in a moment or have the resilience to hold it or whatever. The point being is that in third dimension, we start to make that mind body connection conscious. The one that's shutting us down, the, the, the one that seems to require us to manage things that, so as you make that conscious, you almost like you have a choice when you start to see that between second, and third dimension, something happens where instead of going to safety, because it's all you can do in second dimension. You can't go to freedom really because the, the freedom is locked down in the repression, you know? So you can only manage and stay safe. But as you go into third dimension and you start making that conscious, it's almost like you have a choice in that moment. I can make that conscious and just not shut down around that, or I can shut down around it and sort of regulate. And sometimes you have to do that. Mm -hmm. But in third dimension, what we're doing is we're moving through those states of shutdown. Mm -hmm. instead of just shutting down so that's it i think is the mind body connection is what it is for me once you start making it conscious it's like you now see the operating system is doing all that the question is are you going to turn and make that conscious when it's doing it or are you just going to stay unconscious to it shut down and regulate mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah so i guess let's say i'm joe and uh, i finished the relationship and And I, I don't feel much, but uh, something is not right. And I have contractions, so I could, I could go and go to the gym. And I could do uh, ascension meditation, and like, uh, or with, uh, let's say Jesus or some saint loving me, or I can do breath work, and ice bath which actually i highly recommend for people to do um or i can uh pray or whatever do these things that will soothe this discomfort that i don't even know what this is this discomfort i'm soothing it and then i can meditate actually and i put muji guided meditation or somebody else i mean i, I like muji don't get me wrong and then um and then I'm feeling kind of calm and it's like, yeah, hmm. okay, so I could do that. So now it feels safe and it feels like I, I'm back. I'm back. Yeah. Or I could. So what I'm doing now, me as Joe, I'm like, I know that this is sadness that I don't want to feel. My father didn't want to feel. My grandfather couldn't feel. So now I'm using some mining tools to make it make it here and then to make it conscious the thought form in it yeah there's sadness i'm sad and i'm sad and i'm sad so i'm kind of almost repeating this we'll go into some of the tools repeating this consciously and i'm sad because what's the thought in it i i lost i lost family this thought comes more sadness comes i lost love i am alone in the whole world I'm, I'm, um, oh, then we go into other things like we, I think we might have to do a third part because we are still talking generally here and it would be nice to go in depth. You know, I'm, the Joe goes into the so-called trauma or commands, trauma commands, like, don't go, don't leave me, don't leave me, don't leave me. I had this, me as Joe. I had this several times in my life when the little Mihai, little Joe, will say this to somebody. And then I forgot. I became tough and spiritual. Uh, but underneath there is this don't leave me, don't leave me. And the whole system was don't even go there. Don't go there. So now I, I know that it's in there. And I'm consciously bringing this up. And as I do that, it brings more sadness and then fear. And so, and it's really hard. And some part of me is like, 
I hate this shit. I hate this feeling, man. But then a part of me knows because I'm ready and I've done this enough. I know there's nothing's going to change if I keep avoiding this. So I'm going into it. And honestly, if I really go, because now I have tools, I have trust, I have a community, I have a facilitator. I'm going deep for like 12 minutes, 17 minutes. It goes and I'm like, okay. It's even like, that was nice. I like that. That was cool. Then I feel good. I go about the day. In the evening, I might have to do another 17 minute session. Uh, so anyway, now, yeah, I feel like now I'm really no longer avoiding and what's on the map here, fear of feeling. We have this, the need of safety <laughs> is that, no, I'm not going to die. You're not going to die. Is the fear of feeling, which is also archetypal, I guess. Yeah. And one of my non-dual teachers would say to me, Hey, when you have this, why let it devour you, man? Let it devour you. This these feelings, this sense of lack, this sense of longing, let it devour you. And I, I love that. I was like, yes, yes. But I couldn't do it. I couldn't do it because as soon as the tiger will just show a little bit to devour me, I would just suppress, avoid, smoke, drink get out um but with this third dimension tools i feel like i can really finally do what francis used to tell me to let it devour me i let this sadness devour me or this fear devour me and he's right and he will chuckle he will say and see that if it happens like that because it can't it, it will this is just a wave of feeling you know but before I couldn't let it devour me. Exactly. So here's the thing, the fear of death. And we talk about that in the non-dual path. But if you say the death of the self, well, there isn't one. So, okay, what are you really afraid of? What are we really afraid of? If you think that you've dealt with the fear of death, let me do some repression work with you. <laughs> that's what I want to say. Because until you've dealt with it at that level, that's a visceral level terror. Like sadness at that level is really scary. The way you're saying that, I felt into that. It, anger was like that for me, not sadness. Mm -hmm. But like right there, you, you, so all those folks on the non-dual path where you're dealing with the fear of death in first and second dimension, there's a somatic part of this. Yeah. It's not just the, there's this mind entity that you're saying doesn't exist and it's not gonna die is only part of the equation of the fear of death. That thing that you think you are, the emotional stuff that you really don't wanna feel it feels terrifying. So throughout your life, when you, you know, could have felt that sadness or with me anger, think about the terror that came in to hold that back. So you've got fear frozen in the body, not just grief or anger, but fear is frozen yet, frozen in that. What I'm here to tell people is if you think you've done the fear of death thing in the awakening, you have to do it at the somatic level because you can't say that you're not afraid to die if in fact you can't open to sadness or me anger because that feels like a death. No. Yeah. Open. Yeah. yeah. Hmm. And that scares people. I get that. But that's why we've done it too lightly. You see, do we want the safer version of the fear of death where we just question the self and there's no entity there and feel a little bit of fear or a lot maybe? Here you're going to feel real, real terror. <laughs> real terror and that's going to be even more healing though because you're you're getting into that like that thing mm -hmm. that frozen layer of fear is i think where the real freedom is because mm -hmm. there's such a fear of death around it fear because you know it feels like that like if i would express anger it'd be like that's it it's over you know like that feels like death they're going to kill me i'm not i'm going to lose everybody mm. death mm. yeah and you know in a in a more thorough, not neo-advaita uh, or cherry-picking advaita, but in the traditional advaita, they talk uh, about that. Um, okay, find that there's the witness. There's the witness. There's the witness, and things come and go. Then 
find that I am the witness, the what is called I is the witnessing. And is this process, then you'll have a bunch of mental formations. They call it the I thought. Oh, then, or in the process of realizing I'm the witness, there's all of these mind identities and uh, identity as a story, identity as a belief, identity as a concept. So they talk about the uh, seeing through the I thought and that I being not the real I, being illusory, being a thought, a story, and it collapses and the mind gets increasingly more quiet. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, then the, the mind doesn't harass me anymore. I don't have crazy thoughts all the time. I don't have past and future worries. So the mind is more quiet. That seems like I have arrived. Uh, and there is realization that I am that doesn't come and go. They speak about that. But then they say, hey, this is not even 50% of the journey because there is the so-called uh, I feeling now. Yeah. This, what I would be the pain body and uh, the sense of me as a, as a feeling, which is in the feeling that shows, <laughs> but they didn't speak about that. It's the I feeling in the feeling that doesn't show. Yeah. And so for true liberation from suffering and to what they say to really enjoy the fruits of awakening that's what they say if you really want to enjoy the fruits of awakening not just to have a dry awakening one need to face the this stuff the, the fear the sadness the 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 shame the guilt the that may be there buried down under this they are there, not they may be. They are there, uh, buried down on this. So basically the third dimension practices, the second and the third dimension tools in KI are as a way to really uh, um, bring awareness to the me feeling that Ramana was talking about and other new world. And, and the misunderstanding was that, well, it just comes sometimes and I see it and I allow it. It doesn't work like that, at least in the West now, because it just barely picks its head a little bit, you know? And actually there's a lot there. It's a whole tree. Uh, so, yeah. Yeah. Um, well, this is a good topic. Let me say this about it, the me feeling, because I love the one you brought that up last time. I think in first dimension, a lot of this sense that it's like, we, like you say, we question mind, but we, it's like, because people used to come to me all the time and say, yeah, I get that. that, that yeah, that stuff comes and goes, but there's a sense of me in my stomach, <laughs> you know? So, okay, well, let's go third dimension. Let's go down in the stomach. Let's see what's there. And then we start seeing identity more, you know, like not good enough, whatever. And then that me feeling starts to transmute a little bit more, but for so many They'll do that and they'll even see the emptiness of that, but it's still a mm -hmm. sense of me feeling. And that becomes really elusive at that point. If you don't have skill, you don't know what to do because yeah. in non-duality, it's all about questioning identity. Mm -hmm. If there's still a me feeling, what do you do with that? Yeah. <laughs> but what, what I think it is, is this. It's a lot of it, that me feeling, not all of it, is the trauma and the repression that's just really unconscious is what it is. Mm -hmm. And that, that explains why through the years, I mean, if I think about the chronic pain, if I were to be really honest, there was a me feeling in there. Yeah. So, but it wasn't a lot of thoughts that I was aware of at first. It wasn't like strong identity at all, but there was definitely a me feeling in there. And as I go in, or I went in, I discovered what that was. I <laughs> can't express anger, but I am angry, me feeling. You see, that's that made sense to me. So if anybody's dealing with that me feeling that feels very elusive, could it be that? That's what I'm saying. Could it be that? And if you keep not being able to get to it, that's probably what it is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and I, you know, it's, they, they are the second dimension practices that make the unconscious conscious to some degree. And I really like Byron Katie method the questions 
And so there's a thought, you know, I'm unworthy or I'm alone, let's say, I'm, I'm alone. And I go through the steps. Is this true? Yeah, man, it's true. Yeah. Is this really true? Really, really, really true all the time, 100%? Yes. No, man, it's not true. And I have evidence of this, how it's not true. And then going through the steps, you know, how does it make me feel when I believe that I'm alone in the world? And then how would I be without this thought and this or that? And maybe the opposite thought is true. I'm not alone. I'm never alone. It's all the time. We're all together here. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, and I see it. I see that that, that thought, the me thought, is not true. It's not true. And actually the opposite is true. I've done this with, with clients. Um, and it's like, yeah. But then we do a reverse inquiry and, and uh, it still feels it's true. It still it still feels I'm alone or still feels I'm unworthy. Yeah. So I could see that that was not sufficient because this I'm unworthy or I don't matter. Or let's say I let's say I don't I don't matter, I'm bad or I'm alone. Actually, this this me thought. Actually, there is the fueled by the, the, the deeper layer. Let's say that I am alone is fueled by deep sadness that is not allowed and deep grief and attachment trauma and fear right. and terror that is not allowed. Uh, but for the third dimension, we go into, okay, and I know that basically, I know I'm not alone, actually. But so now it is there's sadness <laughs> and there's the repression of sadness. Mm -hmm. So fear and uh, hold back, be strong, don't go there. So mm -hmm. somehow, or again, like I'm bad. And these are these are these are examples from actual people. We are not theory here. Mm -hmm. Jane, I'm bad, I'm selfish, I'm bad, I'm selfish. Although She's not. She's fucking kind and loving and, yeah. and like a fucking helping people all the time. Yeah. Underneath abandonment, underneath abandonment as a baby, mm -hmm. there is fear, there is hatred, hatred, uh, fear, and it's not okay to go there. So it mm -hmm. keeps all these energies trapped. And then it gives the feeling that I'm bad. <laughs> And yeah. so the way to go is not no longer challenge that I'm not bad. Hey, you see, you're not bad. You are good, actually. No, it's to actually allow oneself to feel the hatred. Yes. The hatred towards others, towards myself, and then the fear. And yeah. And so then by going to these primal energies connected to trauma, then there's a, it's like a, the balloons, like, it, it diminishes and mysteriously the I am bad or I'm alone is seen through even more it's not true man yes and there is a more sense of freedom and okayness yeah yeah you just did some really important things there I want to break that down I want yes. to slow you down now so you slow me down because if everybody could just hear what we just said here, listen to this. You question your first dimension or second dimension, you eventually get to questioning identity. It goes quiet. It can go quiet substantially, but there's still the me feeling left over for people is what he's saying. Mm -hmm. So you can go second dimension very deeply mm -hmm. like I did, and you just don't see much identity. Mm -hmm. You're not getting to repression. You don't see much identity after a while, but there's still, for some people, some me feeling. So mine was chronic pain. Other people, it'll be contraction. It'll it'll even get to a place like it can be where it seems like there is no self, but there's still a me feeling. So if you listen to that, why is there a me feeling? <laughs> it's not just a feeling. It's a me feeling because there's still mind on it. And if you can hear that, the mind is not, okay, yeah, there's the I'm bad down there. Of course, the identity. But under that is I'm sad, but I can't express it. I, me. That's the thing that's not getting met. Yeah. So, right. So we're looking at identity, identity, identity. That is off limits. Yeah. I am sad. 
is off limits. There's your me feeling, or I am angry for a lot of you. And what also Mihai just said, if you listen, is he threw in the, well, then why does the I'm bad? Why is that me feeling? Well, think about it. That's who you have to see yourself as if you can't be yourself. So the programming says you can't express that. So this false thing is connected to it. False thing. You know what I mean? Like, that's why you're discovering that identity still in the body. I think it's right there with the repression. Yeah. Yeah. You know, in, in my, in the Joe case. <laughs> or Joe. Joe. Yeah. Uh, and I know somebody, Joe, we are not talking about Joe. So it's more like me uh, or other people. Um, when I didn't have access to go into, didn't have access or I would be afraid to access the, the lowest level, like in Inception, uh, of to, to feel the so-called abandonment, actually, abandonment which is like, it's a cocktail of, I am sad, I am afraid, I am alone, please don't leave me, I'm going to die, and I don't want to feel this. <laughs> this is what we call abandonment. It's a mixture of this thought, feeling, energies. <sighs> yeah? But yeah. before I was going there, I, there will be just a little bit of that and then I would land like as like there's something wrong with me I will never have a good relationship and it will go into I cannot love I cannot love you know like this makes me cry like there's something wrong with me I cannot love and this makes sense like if I can yeah. if I cannot feel fully through the sadness and the fear I cannot love really. Right. <laughs> so so if I really want to be able to love in a in a more true way, not infatuation or getting or some romantic bullshit. Yeah, I think one cannot really love. We want love. We talk about love and fuck. We talk about love, but we cannot feel love, true love. I don't if if I don't feel fear, the sadness and the, all of that. And so there's something wrong with me. Yeah, there's something wrong with me is that I I, I can't I don't allow fear and sadness. <laughs> right? Yeah. Or in my case, anger. Yeah. Right. I mean, that's another thing to slow down there, Mihai, because yeah. that's really important. Like I've had the same insight. This whole deficiency story, of course, because I'm actually lacking primary resources. Of course, I'm going to feel separate, lacking, and deficient. It's actually in part because of the trauma and repression. This is what I'm saying to people. Yeah. You're, why wouldn't you feel lacking and deficient if you, you don't have access to something that's natural for all of us, whatever that is? Yeah. Yeah. See, now this, when they talk in in good, in in, in a... In the in a sophisticated first dimension teachings, they talk about that the in the non-duality that the, the cause of suffering. One of my teachers would say several teachers they talk about this highly reputable and teachers that I would recommend for getting a foundation of awareness and and deep philosophical understanding of reality like Rupert and Francis and uh, Muji. And um, although I truly, with all the respect and love, they're eh, missing something. They will say that the core cause of suffering is that the sense, the, the sense of being, the sense of separation and the belief and the feeling sense of being a separate, limited, independent entity. And and that shows up as a sense of lack. There's a sense of lack. So we are encouraged to welcome the sense of lack. Something is missing, something is wrong. But it, somehow I couldn't do this wholesale. Yeah. The sense of lack or the something is missing 
is very much connected with not allowing fully to um, I lack the ability to feel fully. Yeah, it's that simple. It's like keep it simple. Yeah. That's yeah. what it was. Yeah. There's a modern day teacher. She's not very known. Uh, I and she was very helpful for me. Satyama, her name is. And uh, she would say this that enlightenment is to feel everything. <laughs> You know, feel everything consciously. Nothing, nothing is off the table. You know, including so, the yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Now, also, yeah. that sounds like at the same level. Let it devour you, and and you know, a friend of mine sent me this quote: "Enlightenment is feeling everything." Two years ago, and I was mm -hmm. like, yeah. <laughs> "Yeah, yes, that's it." But yeah. that's I couldn't do it, man. I couldn't do that. Allow that. Yeah, I don't, allow yeah, that. my system doesn't allow me to do that. And now I'm really in the trenches. I guess to to I think because it's so big and the 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 habit of of avoiding feeling is so big, backed up by my ancestors, that they needed to do that, man. In a actually to have to have time for me to do repression work. It's a fucking luxury, man. It is, really. Like, think if about in Ukraine, like if right. I were now in many parts of the world, there's no, man, I have to suck it up, be strong, fight, right. provide. So the repression from one angle, it was uh, the divine quality to keep going. Mm -hmm. you know? so yeah, mm -hmm. so so it's a great luxury to be able to, to do that. Yeah, I lost my thought here. Uh, <laughs> well, yeah, now I have the time and the tools to take this huge, seeming huge pain and parcel it down in in small bites. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, what I want to say about that, because I totally agree with you, like, if you think about people, for example, who were in the Holocaust, they were surviving, if that. Like, and we have the luxury now for those of us who are not in those situations to question some of this. However, what I want to say, the caveat there is there are people right now in abusive relationships or something who might even use that as an excuse not to process. So, you know, there's, there's, there's two things here. One is sometimes we just have to physically do things to stay safe and survive period. But that does not exclude processing. Like if, you know what I mean? Like we don't want to use that as an excuse. Like, okay, yeah, if you're in a situation where you're really, really surviving, first thing is survival or get away, stay safe for sure. Mm -hmm. But right after that would be healing and processing. Otherwise, yeah, you're carrying it around forever. You're traumatizing yourself forever for, from that. Yeah. And we transmit this. I mean, this is known, the epigenetics. Uh, we transmit this as I started to do deeper awareness-based somatic work in a clear consciousness. And then also as I experienced uh, psychedelic assisted processing in both situations, I could see that this is totally my father's programming, my father's strategic adaptations and my mother's, they are here with me, they are here. So they're transmitted to me and I, I can see I was really young, a boy and, and somebody, the closest person to me died when I was really young and I didn't feel anything. So already so young, I got this for osmosis in the culture from my father yeah. to not feel you know so yep. now if i don't undo this if i have a child it's just mirroring neurons there's science now that it's just this it's a becomes a replica uh you know so is the the guy is going to have what my father and grandfather had so that's really uh it's 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 important to realize this and in you know even bowen, bowen and other major uh masters of psychotherapy like 70 years ago they realized this the generational transmission and i'm not sure 
if your anger repression is just connected to your bullying experience if you look into i even you have a you had some method like to see your repression and to see your lineage male and female and and see what's the correlation there <laughs> yeah well, yeah for me on my mom's side the whole family repressed pretty much all emotion except for sadness that's why i don't have a strong sadness i don't think yeah it's intergenerational so if i so i used that in my inquiry i would go into that family and be there and it's just like yeah no emotion is allowed unless you're just showing sadness like but everything else yeah. including joy and even love all that was shut down yeah and i just early on in life i picked that up without even knowing that that's what mom does and that's what i have to do mm -hmm. so <laughs> mom allowed sadness but not anger so you got that yeah well so you can allow victimhood i should say that mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. like people are doing things to you and you can complain about that and feel like hard done by or hurt but not anger <laughs> and not anything else really mm -hmm. yeah all right so I realized, Scott, we, we realized together that we are still talking now at this level of uh, increasing understanding about the third dimension practices and how it correlates with awakening and second dimension. And, and we haven't really gotten into the nitty gritty of the method. And we are going to do that. We are going to have another third part where we go into the nitty gritty, <laughs> how's it called that? bolts nuts and bolts yeah, nuts and bolts of it so we'll just kind of riff a little bit here now still on the context so if we can touch briefly on to what are the let's say negative impacts disadvantages of not doing this kind of work even besides chronic pain and diagnosis and cancer although that's a big one what are yeah. the negative impacts and what are the positive outcomes of that? And maybe what will be some temporary traps or pitfalls or fears we may have as as this emotion starts to flow? <laughs> mm -hmm. um, so the, I have to go back to the map because, and speak from direct experience too. The negative impact other than the chronic, here are the, here are the things that I've seen through the years. These are the things that I've seen. Yeah. So shadows and, and triggers that translate to actual emotional suffering in people's lives. That's what that is. That's yeah. triggers. That's like, that's not peace. That is not joy, a life like that. So that right there is the negative. You're just not getting to the root of it. If you don't get to the root of it, you can expect that to continue to some degree, even if it thins out over time, and there's less triggers. The question is, is why what's still there that you haven't, Matt, so that can continue. Um, addictions are the big one. I have to say, that seems like the big one for a lot of people. It's really hard to resolve addictions. You can put things down, obviously, before you resolve things. And that's, to me, not really, that's, that's successful. But it's not a measure of healing. It's just a measure of sobriety. So watching, continuing, compulsions, that's a big deal for people. Um, look for that, everybody. Mental health issues, diagnosed or undiagnosed, that continue doesn't matter they don't have to be diagnosed look for different things that are you know that keep appearing this is the negative result i think of doing not doing it because these are the effects of it so yeah. these things might continue thinking uh thinking that's velcroed so one of the negative results is that there's a certain amount of thinking that when you think about it you feel <laughs> it's painful but when you do the repression work you're going to all those other areas where your mind can go into things like anger all kinds of things you couldn't go to and when you're thinking about it you just don't feel velcro so you don't get caught up in it mm -hmm. you know like before when you're repressing anger storing anger or whatever when you get close to that topic there's like a you know what i mean like yeah. thinking and like for example if you can't express anger the idea of speaking up to somebody can bring fear and shaking and self-doubt and self-talk that no <laughs> when you reverse the repression that thinking and a lot of other thinking around that can go quieter around that the big i have to keep saying body your body is your negative result for repression i think for a lot of you it's going to be contractions that just persist body stuff 
Um, yeah, persistent deficiency story. Although I know yeah. it's not true, it still feels true that I'm not, I don't matter, I'm not safe, I'm alone. No. Persists. Um, yeah. Persistent relational patterns. The mm -hmm. same situation happens all over again because the core fuel hasn't been, yeah, hasn't been resolved. Right. Yeah, I was going to say deficiency stories next, but you're right that that continues. Um, but like anything, any of these things could be negative results. I could list them all. Yeah. The positive benefit is the absence of a lot of that. First. Yeah. <laughs> There's one benefit is just you don't have to deal with a lot of that. My pain went away. So everything that attended the suffering with my chronic pain is gone. That's a big change. So I, I don't want to say that one of the benefits is healing. But one of the benefits can be healing. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I just can't promise that. Um, you know, I didn't have, I didn't get to a chronic pain level. Also, I'm younger than you. <laughs> I might yeah. have gotten it if I didn't meet this work. Uh, but definitely, I could see chronic um, or the tension, contraction, strong sensations that were either in the chest or in the belly or in the this that will not be there all the time but they will be there and what they needed they wanted me to they wanted me to escape them i wanted to escape them through non-dual stuff or through uh substances uh and as i went through different stages of repression different types of types of repression work it will clear so i'll be like oh wow i used to have this a lot i don't have it now wow it was like and so then all the effort that was put into to escape that and to to be done with that and so all that energy comes back to 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 me and i i guess this thing what they call about causeless joy there is a sense of like oh it's okay uh i'm enjoying life more there is all that energy that was spent in resisting and managing without even knowing is mm -hmm. going into joy, enthusiasm, drive, mission. You know, we mm -hmm. talk about the sense of mission. It's hard to really go 100%. I yeah. want a long time ago, one of my mission was in men's work was to, I want to live fully, 100%, <sighs> fully. 15 years ago, I wanted this. And so it's hard to live fully if I'm caught in all of these things that I don't want to feel. So... So now I can feel I can feel more I can live more fully. Yeah. And I can be vulnerable. I can I can I can be angry if I need to. Yeah. I can be scary. I can cry. I mean, that's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. And so this is the thing. People who don't have not reversed, they wouldn't know what we're talking about in terms of energetic flow. Yeah. That's why we have to talk about it. Because if you've been repressed, you don't even have a point of reference for it. That's what I've learned. Okay, you don't really know what flow is if you've never experienced it. It's a real thing. It's a word. But it points to you're just not getting stuck in a lot of different places in relationship and life. So there's just movement. Yeah. You know, it's like you can just respond to somebody more clearly. And so you don't get trapped into all that hem hawing around with people where you're monitoring their reaction to everything you're doing. Yeah. And it's, there's a flow. You just, you know, it's hard to explain. I feel better physically i just feel better overall like i don't know how to explain that but i do um makes sense because i'm not storing anger <laughs> it yeah. probably doesn't feel good so yeah there's that i don't want to put too many carrots out there but at the same time i think that one of the reasons we've stayed in repression is because we haven't put enough carrots out there yeah you know like to show people that this is possible that there's really great benefit here and in the non-dual world it's like don't talk about that and create seeking which is true but I feel like we're selling our, each other short or something in this. It's like, it's not just about putting seeking to rest, y'all. It's not just about putting that to rest. There's more to this than that, than just no longer seeking. And so can we up the ante here with realization a little bit? More than just, I don't want to seek, you know? Yeah, There's as you say, put the horse before the carriage, put the carriage before the horse. The seeking is going to continue as long as I have th feelings I don't want to feel. I mean, how can it be? How can right. I be at peace when I'm not at peace? <laughs> right. It's not possible. Yeah. So all right. of this new Advaita, like, hey, just the very seeking, just drop it. 
Good luck with that, man. Yeah, not if you have this, because yeah. you're always going to be trying to feel something different when you have that. That's the season. Yeah. Ultimately, I agree with non-duality. I mean, doing this work really with the embodied processing of the trauma will lead to awakening and liberation from suffering. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. Liberation awesome. from suffering. And when there's that, as one of my teachers used to say, you go increasingly from, instead of being afraid all the time, I'm okay. I'm okay. Then it goes into I'm okay and I'm pretty joyful. <laughs> I have peace. And now I have this peace and joy and love and okay. You know, but it, it's like gradual. <laughs> yeah, I think sometimes we set the bar low because we've been suffering so long. It's like, if I can just have some peace, I'm good. Well, that's good. But yeah. there's actually more available than just peace. Yeah. 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 All right. I think that maybe we can uh, stop here. And next time we are really going to uh, go into, okay, how about how, where do we enter this third dimension work and what, first, how to identify our uh, primary repression or repressions and how to get into it and what tools we can use and uh, also the need to work with someone as well as the need to continue on one's own. It's like, you know, I'm feeling really good. But all throughout this talk, I feel, I honestly, I felt um, I, I have um, some contraction in my chest. And before this talk, I've done some third dimension practices to keep allowing this, what's happening in my life, sadness, grief. But it, I, it was, there's more. And so now I, I keep it contained. I'm aware of it. I don't have time now to go into it. I'm aware of it and it's okay. Yeah. Now I have some things to do. Yeah. I'm going to do these things. And then tonight they are going to yeah. wait for me, these contractions. Yeah. I know that this contraction is more sadness, more fear that, that I'm going to meet and I'm going to survive and it's going to be okay. And probably tomorrow morning I'll do that too. And Usually, when I do that, then the contraction goes away. Yeah. I feel joy, uh, and it's good. So this is an ongoing. It's not a one-time kind of cathartic thing. Right. And the other thing is, um, some people think that if they start this work, they might open the can of worms and they just can't. But it's not really like that. So it's like more like what you said. Yeah. It's like during my pain, I would start to feel the pain. I'd be like, uh huh, there's some anger repression. I would, I'd know it during a session. Yeah. And it, afterwards, I just go right to it. But, but yeah. our system protects us so that we don't yeah. actually lose yeah. control. Like it'll seal it back up for us and we can function and then come back to it. Yeah. I think that's one of the reasons maybe some people are getting scared of because they think if I open, I'll just be angry all day long. And most of the time, it's not like that. You know, yeah. 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 It's a true spiritual warrior. In men's work, they were like, I have the need to have range. And actually, you can't have range unless you undo repression. What they meant is to, I can be like a, like a sword, sharp, decisive, boundaries, strong leadership, anger online, and at the throw of a hat yeah. or a drop of a hat, I can cry. Yeah. I can be vulnerable. And it's then there is the, 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 the zombies are coming. And I need to hold it together and sure. kill some of them and save my family. And yeah. I go back there and then we all cry. <laughs> so, right. you know, That's yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it was really healthy to me. I don't know yeah. about you. All right, Scott. So let's stay tuned for part three. And uh, yeah, may it benefit us and our friends and future generations, hopefully. Thank you, Miha. My <laughs> pleasure. Thank you. Bye-bye.